here today and that, uh, that video, the thing that just really caught my mind the most. You know, we've had a lot of emptiness, have we not, in recent months? But we need to remember the empty gives us the promise. It reminds us of the promise of what's ahead. And I even believe that with all of the emptiness that has happened in the last few months that's impacted you, that's impacted me, uh, all of that, if we will just remember that we face our crosses before we face the glory of the resurrection. And I really believe that our church is going to rise above this. I believe that there is an opportunity for a great awakening in churches across our land. So yeah, the reason I believe that, I believe that because if that were not true, according to the scriptures in the book of 2 Thessalonians, Jesus would come back. If there wasn't any more hope, Jesus would come back. So because of that, I believe that we can rise above this emptiness. I believe it with all of my heart. Now, I want to read a card to you to begin our services today, and it just simply says, during a time like this, we realize how much our friends and relatives really mean to us. Your expression of sympathy will always be remembered. Thank you so much for the funeral meal you had for our family on the death of Sharon Trent, our loved one. We did not expect it as they were not members, but it was so delicious and so appreciated. God bless you for this loving act. All of our love, uh, Robert and Sherry Weatherford and the Trent family. And so we uh, read that and share that on, on their behalf here today. Uh, I wanted to begin uh, just by sharing a few words with you before we begin, uh, before we begin our services and before we begin singing. At this very moment, in Hendersonville, Tennessee, they, uh, a man by the name of Jason Ball, a young man, is about to assume uh, the pulpit to preach his first sermon as the pastor of the church that I vacated. And he is not, he has never been a lead pastor before. He's never been the senior pastor anywhere before. And i got to tell you about this uh, young man. He is a fireball. He is a great, great man of God. And, uh, and getting started for him, there have been some challenges that have come up. And, and I believe that he is the man, God's man, to face these challenges. I'm going to invite you, if you don't mind, to stand with me and support me in prayer as I pray for this man as he delivers his first sermon. He's probably starting right now. All right, let's just pray together. Father God, I want to lift up Jason right now. Lord, I've been talking with him on the phone, and Lord, uh, he is definitely a man of God. I've heard him preach on the uh, Internet, dear God, and, and it is very, very clear that he is a man that you have appointed for a great task, for a great moment. So, Lord, I pray that you would be with Jason right now. I pray that you would be with the Center Point Church. Dear Father, I pray that something will happen in that service, dear Father, to set a new precedent of the direction where you want to take that congregation. And, Lord, I am so thankful for my many years there, and I thank you for bringing me here. I thank you for allowing me at this stage in my life uh, uh, to have a new beginning, to enjoy something fresh and exciting. I thank you for my new friends here, and I thank you for the growth that we're going to experience together. I pray that you would enable us today to worship freely, and dear God, I pray that in our services here as well, something great would happen. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
see everybody here today. Um, this is trying times indeed, and each week we're seeing our church family coming back, starting to fill this place up, and this is truly where we get a breath of fresh air. Our scripture reading this morning is from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, verses 16 and 18. Um, God's word says, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly, outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. I know a lot of times Patty and I joke at home and say, you know, getting old really stinks. <laughs> we go out and we mow and we do this chore and do that chore. And we get up in the mornings and we say, yeah, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. At the end of the day, we're so tired and hurt so much, and everything that you know, the brain says go, and the body says stop. And you know, we stop and think, I used to be able to do this not too long ago. And then, with this recent thing that I've gone through, I've fallen off a ladder, um, it really slowed me down. And I think, you know, 15, 20 years ago, it had been a bump in the road, and I'd been up doing plenty of things, but as we get older, it gets harder to do the things we used to do. We're slower and we ache more and, and um, just we wonder where it all went. But a lot of you know my past, you know, it was nothing that uh, was pleasing to the Lord. But since I've come to know Him, you know, I didn't know Him at a, at a young age, but as I've gotten older and tireder and slower, my knowledge of him has increased. And uh, each day I learn more. I learn how to apply his word in my life. I understand more what uh, Jesus' sacrifice means to me. And uh, so we may slow down, we may increase, but uh, our minds open up and we're able to take in more. So take it from me. Try not to. <laughs> Focus on what you can't do anymore, or what's harder to do anymore. But take this time and, and focus on God. Uh, learn how to apply this more to our lives, and uh, enjoy, enjoy. I know I. And may the Lord add a blessing to the reading of His Word. This time we we'll go to our prayer list, and it has been busy this week. Um, one uh, prayer requests and concerns we've been made aware of. Uh, let's continue to remember the McCarty family. Uh, Pastor Mike's son, who is uh, now home, praise, praise the Lord, doing much better. Uh, grandchildren are doing good. Again, they seem to bounce back faster than we do. Uh, Tim Redmond has come down with COVID-19. I think he's in his sixth day now, sixth or seventh day. Uh, he's at home and uh, doing okay. Uh, Rodney and Stephanie Cole uh, called the other night to uh, their daughter-in-law's leaving for Texas to be with her father who's dealing with a, a lot of health issues. Just remember to keep them in prayer. Uh, Donna Heath uh, was requesting prayer for Kent T. Polk, who was injured in a farming accident and is paralyzed from neck down. He is no longer paralyzed, but... They had surgery, and uh, they don't know how long the rehab is going to take, but, but they were able to relieve the pressure off the spine, and, and they do believe he will walk again. How much he, how much he regains remains to be seen. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, Paul Wade, uh, successfully recovering from gallbladder surgery. Is he home now? No, he's in a rehab center. Okay. He's doing well. Okay. Janet Toller uh, had heart catheterization, and I believe she's home. Yes. Don Sterling still near New York, or New York. <laughs> New Harmony Nursing Home, and uh, can have visits, so 
If you'd like to go see him, uh, just call and make an appointment. Uh, Buddy Simpson, let's keep him in prayer, dealing with cancer. Uh, Renee Douglas and Ruth Ann Douglas are both recovering from surgeries. Uh, Karen Anderson continues to have some health issues and has an upcoming surgery. Uh, do we have any other prayer requests that we made this morning? I have one. Uh, my step granddaughter, Jane, she's got a really serious lung disease. And her daughter got the COVID 19. So they took, they had her in Nashville in a hotel room and will never leave the room because of that. And she'll have to be there until the daughter gets over the COVID. So uh, I really would ask her to believe her. This is very serious for the, for the mom because she's going to die if she gets it and they told her she So very serious. Thank you. Let's remember Vera's family. Nancy and Shelby. Who? Nancy and Shelley. Nancy and Shelley. Uh, been affected by the COVID virus. Ed? I'd like to give another update on my cousin, Nelda uh, Cersei Beach. She is at home now. Um, she spent most of the last year down at MD Anderson getting treatment. But um, her, her cancer has metastasized, and they brought her home this week on an air ambulance. She didn't want any more treatment, so she's come home, and she's uh, on hospice now. She's doing fairly well. She came home. They had a hospital bed ready, and she said, no, I'm sleeping in my own bed. She was sitting up in the chair, so she's having a few good days here. But just keep her in prayer as um, time goes on today. And I still believe in miracles. Amen. Thank you, Debbie. Anyone else? Marita? Uh, Ruth Ann uh, Douglas had surgery. Anybody else? Again, I'll see to well if you have one, get your hand up. Randy? We uh, know two individuals, two men uh, locally, and I know in their last days, we just learned that. I'm not going to mention their names because I don't know how well they publicized that to me. So just pray for these two men in our community. I know people in this church know that they are in their last days. Anyone else? Okay. Um, Jim Bonner's wife, um, Hilda, she had that pneumonia, but uh, as of like four days ago, she, he said that she was home and um, that she's doing okay. She's taking medication. She's getting stronger and getting better. Hilda Donner at home from Mount Dillon. The government. I'd also like to give praise. Our oldest daughter, Rebecca, had a LASIK eye surgery and uh, came through on that with my colors, so praise the Lord. Any other prayer requests or praises? this week. Amen. Amen. We may have some troubling times, but that's always we're going to give praise where praise is due. Let's also remember our country, our leaders, our military, and uh, 
persecuted Christians in this time, we don't normally stop and think about that. But we still see on the news in various parts of the world how people are murdered and, and removed from where they live. And we need to remember them in prayer and also be thankful that we live where we do. Let's also know that those who don't know Jesus Christ is their first and Savior. Remember to read your uh, uh, prayer requests in the bulletin. And uh, that's it. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just come to you today, Lord, with open hearts and thankful hearts, Lord. We just thank you for this time that we're able to come together, Lord, and just praise and celebrate your name, Lord. Lift the name of Jesus. Father, we just thank you for the countless blessings that you shower on us, Lord. And we just ever so thankful. Father, we just lift up these people that we brought to you in prayer this morning, Lord. Would you touch each one of them, Lord, according to your will, Lord, in a special way that they may need it. Lord, we just ask that you protect all of us, Lord, keep us in your hands. We just ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. I had it in my plans today to uh, show a video that was uh, going to target uh, any of our children uh, that are here today, but as it turned out, it wasn't compatible to, to our computer. So, uh, but today I, I do want to announce that within, uh, hopefully within two weeks, uh, we're going to resume our uh, kids club downstairs uh, during this hour. So just uh, wanted to just give you a heads up on that. So if you have kids that are not presently attending that are a part of that kids club, uh, uh, maybe you can get some invites out. I'm looking forward to the next few weeks. Hopefully things will improve in the state of Indiana and things will open up and we will fill this house. That will be wonderful whenever we can do that again. And uh, I, I've selected a video that I believe that living life as a Christian is supposed to be fun. I really do. I believe it is. Why don't you take a look at this video? Hey, what are you kids doing? Well, we're inviting people to our church this week. And for other people say, yes, we tie a balloon to the little box. Oh yeah? Tell me about your church. In the eyes of a child, it's simple to invite someone to church. You're just telling them about something you love. Almost everyone has gone to church at some point in their life, whether it's their christening or Sunday school, Easter or Christmas, or even their wedding. Special events just seem more official when they're happening in a church. So it is simple to invite people. Just tell your neighbors, hey, there are really great things happening every week in our church. And you can consider this your official invitation to come back and join us each Sunday. We'll save a seat for you. Anyway, we did have a lot more people we wanted to invite, but we ran out of balloons. <sighs> Do you have any balloons? What do I look like? A balloon delivery guy? Come here, guys. Desperate. 
I tell you what, I have been looking forward to this moment, and I think that God has been blessing us. God has certainly been uh, blessing me. I want to begin by sharing with you that today I'm in the second sermon of a sermon series in the book of Nehemiah. So if you'll begin turning your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 2, and I'm going to be talking to you about facing the challenge. Now, uh, if you look at the uh, screen today, you'll notice there it looks like a wall's been torn down. There, there's a lot of repair that is needed. I'd like to take your minds back as to what was happening in the Bible. It was between 400 and 500 years before Jesus would walk on the face of the earth. And uh, the uh, people of Judah, the city of Jerusalem, that's the way the walls looked around the city. They were broken down. Ezra had come in and he had rebuilt the house of God. But whenever people would go to worship at the house of God, the enemy would come nearby and disrupt their worship. Think about that. Could that ever happen in our world today? And some of you are saying, yes, it could. We know that it could happen because it happened again after this time. And we don't know but that it might would happen in our land in, within the next year. You know, we've got to face the challenge, and that challenge is we need to decide today to be the people that God has called us to be. And, and we need to decide today to maintain the fact that God's Word will stand, and because God's Word will stand, God's people will stand, and because God's people will stand, God's house will stand. Now, what these people had to do in Nehemiah's day, the only way to deal with the enemy was to build a wall around the city to protect them from the enemy. And that was Nehemiah's task, or it was about to be. I shared with you last week in my message how Nehemiah had felt this call from God whenever he talked from one of his countrymen who had been to Jerusalem. And there are Bible scholars who he refers to one of them as his brother. And there are Bible scholars who believe that there was his literal brother. He said, yeah, I've been to Jerusalem. The city is in reproach. They rebuilt the temple. The house of God is there. But it's going to be torn down before long anyway because there's no protection. There's not a wall built around the city. And so they were vulnerable to their enemies. And so the Bible indicates that Nehemiah began praying. And if you read through chapters 1 and chapters 2, you can put uh, A and B together, and, and you come up with the fact that Nehemiah fasted and prayed for four months. And in today's message, we're going to find out that he's about to approach the king. Now, the king that uh, uh, Nehemiah faced was Artaxerxes. Now, in our case, we go to the king of kings. We go to our Lord and to our God. You know, many of us right now, we're facing some of the greatest challenges our nation has ever faced. And you know as well as I do that I'm not speaking solely of the coronavirus. Now, per perhaps there's some of you here today that you're thinking, I sure wish the preacher would preach on some other subject. I sure wish he'd get up there and he would just give us this message that for 30 minutes would distract us. There are some of you, you'd rather not be constantly reminded of the great mess that our nation is in. But you know what? Whenever you're in the middle of a great trial, whenever you're in the middle of a great challenge, that's when to face that challenge head on. And, and I believe as God's people, He is calling us to stand up. I believe that He is calling us to face our challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, we might have to do it with masks on. But that's alright. We can still do it. I am convinced that most Christians would welcome a change in our country. 
Right? I tell you what, we would love for this year to be the election year of election years. We would love for this year, we would take individuals who are compassionate for Jesus, whether they were Democrat or Republican. We would take people who are passionate for people and love people. I believe that most Christians would welcome a mighty move of God. Well, you're saying amen. But you know, if this were true, why are so few of our churches experiencing the joy of God's presence? Have you noticed today, Christians seem to be living in a sense of defeat. Christians today seem to be living with the sense that they are about to give up. Christians today have forgotten the spirit of true, genuine revival. Listen to me today. If you are not certain of your Christianity, if you're not certain of your salvation today, I want to share with you today that there's hope. I want to share with you today that God is still in control of this world. I want to share with you today that there are still things that we can do to restore America to greatness. No matter how great our problems are, we still serve a God who is greater than any problem that we will ever face. In Europe, years ago, hundreds of years ago, life was as bad as it could be in the church. But then God showed up and the Great Awakening happened. In the United States, whenever our nation was very, very young, in the 1800s, a revival swept through America. whenever people thought that hope was gone. We still serve a God who is greater than any problem we will ever face, and we still serve a God who will take His followers victoriously into the future. He just simply asks us to trust Him. He wants us to trust Him, and He wants us to face our challenges courageously knowing that He has the power to take us through them. He's the key to our success. So just mark that down in your mind right now. He is the key to our success. But unfortunately, when facing the challenges of our lives, most people are simply not willing to pay the price of success. We know God is all-powerful. We know God is still in control. But most Christians today are simply not willing to pay the price of success. Now, I don't know how many hunters we have in our services today, but I feel fairly confident that none of you here today have ever hunted monkeys. And of course, in this case, it would be to hunt them, to capture them for a zoo, or to capture them to study them. Now, I've read this story from several sources. In an effort to capture monkeys, someone came up with the idea that to effectively make a live catch of a monkey, that you would capitalize on the monkey's greed. So here's what they would do. They would take a common element, something that was very, very common to the monkey. They would get a coconut. They would drill a hole in the side. They would scrape the inside out and put some candy on the inside of the coconut. The monkey would come around, snoop around, he would stick his hand in the hole. He would feel the candy. And then he would clutch it in his hand and try to pull the candy out. That was the end of his search, but the beginning of his problem. You see, all he had to do was let go. And he could get his hand out. But he's just too greedy for that. 
So he screams, he hollers, he jumps, and he bangs the coconut against the tree, and soon the hunter hears the commotion and entraps the monkey and seizes his prey. Now all of us would agree that that monkey would have been much better off just to have lost the candy and to save skin. But he wasn't willing to make that choice when it really mattered. And in a very similar way, folks, if we are truly going to have a God-sent revival in our country, you and I are going to have to let some things go. We're going to have to let go of our greed. You see, it will be, revival will come whenever we lay down this idea that life is what you want it to be. I believe that spiritual renewal will come to our nation. I believe that revival will come to our church and even our community whenever we let go of ourselves and we take hold of God. In Nehemiah chapter 2, he reveals some essential elements to face the challenge of revival. Can you imagine? Nehemiah was heartbroken about the broken down walls that surrounded Jerusalem. He was heartbroken over the condition of his nation. They were defenseless. They were defenseless. But Nehemiah could not stay silent. Nehemiah could not remain uninvolved. Whenever he woke up in the morning, his first thoughts were of Jerusalem. Before he fell asleep at night, his evening prayer was about the ruined walls of Jerusalem. So let me ask you today, whenever you think of America, what burdens you the most about this great land of ours? Do you see the decay and the ruin, uh, ruin of our moral values? And if you do, and if you're concerned about that, how can you and I face the challenge that will bring about change to our nation, that will bring about a sense of change to our church, and, and it will bring change to each of us individually? I remember I was holding a revival service several years ago, and uh, whenever I went to preach at this church, I was very familiar with the church, and I knew who the senior deacon was, and it just so happened that the pastor got a virus and was sick the first night of the revival, wasn't able to be there. And uh, the deacon that was there, I had known him for years. We had a remarkable service that evening. A lot of praying together went on. Wonderful things happened, and then as he went to dismiss, the deacon, who really didn't think about what he was saying, he said, ladies and gentlemen, he said, what we need to do is we need to leave the Spirit right here and pick it up tomorrow night where we left it. Now, I laughed at that. I know that's not really what he meant, but I think that that's what we do most of the time on Sunday morning. We get done and we think, okay, that kind of spoke to me. I, I really related to that. And then what do we do? We leave the Holy Spirit right here and we don't take the Holy Spirit with us so that we can be instruments of God to do something great in our community. I believe that you have the capacity and the power just through your compassion, through your concern for others, I believe that you have the capacity to change lives and maybe you don't even realize that. There may be a clerk, that a cash register at Walmart, that's working a cash register at Walmart that's down on her luck. And you might be able to be that encouragement that would get her through her week. So what are we going to do? How can we face the challenge that will bring change to us? In Nehemiah chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, it says, In the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and I gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad whenever I know you're not ill? 
This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid. But I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried, it lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, What is it you want? Now notice this. It says, Then I prayed to the God of heaven. And I answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city of Jerusalem where my fathers are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, how long will your journey take? And when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me. So I set him a time. I also said to him, if it pleases the king that I may have letters to the governors of, of Trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, and may ha uh, uh, so that he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was upon me, the king granted my request. So I went to the governors of the trans-Euphrates, and I gave them the king's letters. The king had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. When Sinbalat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. Let me paraphrase that. When the enemies, Sanballat and Tobiah, heard about this, they were much disturbed that someone had, become, had come to restore worship in Judah. They were disturbed that God was about to move again in Judah. They were disturbed that uh, they were enemies of God and they were disturbed that great things were about to happen among God's people. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, if we're going to face the challenge of our own spiritual renewal, we must first register a request to the king. The first thing that we need to do if we're going to experience spiritual renewal in our lives we must register our request to the king. Nehemiah's request to be sent to Jer Jerusalem was born out of his burden. He had carried this heavy burden in his heart for four months, and his burden was so heavy that he kept on praying, and what happened? God opened the door. God opened the door. Nehemiah was afraid to speak to the king, but God opened the door. God had the king to ask Nehemiah, why are you so sad in my presence? You know, that's not a good thing. It's not good to be sad in the presence of the king whenever you're his butler. It's not a good thing to be sad in the presence of a king who has the authority of life or death over you. But God worked it out so that the king would see that Nehemiah was sad and the king knew that Nehemiah had been a faithful servant of him of his. He said, why is it that your face is sad even though I know you're not sick? Now, let me ask you a question. Who is God going to trust with his work? I want you to think about that for a moment. Who is God going to trust with his work? Is he going to trust you with it? Is he going to trust me with it? Ladies and gentlemen, God trusts the individual who has the heavy burden. And if you have a heavy burden for the needs of our community, if you have a heavy burden for the needs of our nation, if you have a heavy burden for the needs of people around you, if you have a heavy burden for your own life, listen to me, God can use you. He can use you. If our hearts are not burdened with conviction, we will never be fruitful in our service to the Lord. So the king said to Nehemiah, what is it that you're requesting? What are you asking from me? And I want you to notice what Nehemiah did next. He stopped and he took a moment to pray to the God in heaven. 
He took a moment whenever the king said, What is it you're asking of me? And Nehemiah went to the king of kings. He went to his God. When Nehemiah saw the door open, he prayed. Between the king's question and Nehemiah's request was prayer. You know, many of our problems in our nation would be solved if we would learn this lesson. Now, just to the point, simply, Nehemiah said, can I go back on a journey to Jerusalem and just rebuild the walls of the city? Sin. Have you ever made that request to your king, to your God? Lord, I, I, I would like to feel that my life counts for something. Sin. Lord, I would like to think that I can say something that would matter to somebody. Send me. Please send me. There's a victory to be won here, Lord. Please use me. The king made it clear to Nehemiah that because of Nehemiah's passion for others, the king gave Nehemiah his support. So let me ask you today, where is your passion? Where is your compassion for other people today? Our King Jesus said these words in Matthew 7, 7. He said, Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. So notice this. Whenever we make our request to King Jesus, and if that request is a godly, divine request, if that request is for the benefit and for the good of other people who need to be touched by God, Jesus said, ask. It will be given to you. See, you'll find. Just knock and the door can be opened unto you. Friends, if there's anyone here today who is uncertain of your salvation here today, I want you to know that Jesus loves you very, very much. And if you are wanting to be directed and led by Him to a life of usefulness and joy that will end up in His glory in heaven, the Bible says, ask and it will be given unto you. Seek and you will find. Knock and that door will be opened unto you. So as Nehemiah got ready to come back to Jerusalem, he needed three things from the king. The first thing he needed was he needed the king's power or the king's authority. He needed the king's power or authority. He was going to be traveling through territory that was governed by King Artaxerxes. And he would need letters in his hand that said that he had the authority to be where he was at. That he was following the king's commission. And so he carried those letters with him. He also needed provision. He said, send me to Asaph. Doesn't he rule over your forest? Let me go there and let me, uh, let me get the supplies that I need to rebuild these broken down walls. And then, there seems to be a sidebar in there. All of a sudden the king, maybe the king came up with the idea himself. But did you notice he sent a detachment of the army to go with Nehemiah so that Nehemiah would get there alive? Request the king's power. Request the king's provision. And request the king's protection. Have you lately sought your king who has all of this already available for you? Are you living out of his power? Are you living out of his authority? Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. Jesus also said, or Paul said, my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Are you living out of God's protection? You see, God is faithful to give us his power, his provision, and his protection whenever we need it. This takes us to number two. As we face our spiritual challenges, after we have registered our request, I think there comes a point in time that we must do inventory. We need to review the rooms. If there's anything broken down in your life right now, 
if you're not clicking on all eight cylinders, listen ladies and gentlemen, if there's something that just isn't going right, take a moment and look into your life to see if there are any broken down walls there. Take a moment to review the ruins. After three days of counting the cost, Nehemiah had arrived in Jerusalem and he got up in the middle of the night and he went out in the middle of the night to inspect the broken down walls and to see the rubbish just lying in the city. He saw the devastation. He saw how bad things really were. He saw the brokenness that their neglected caused. And Nehemiah also knew something. He knew the enemy is close by. Let me ask you a question. Do you see any brokenness in our nation, in our region, in our community? Do you see any lives that are broken down? And maybe there's areas of your life that are broken down. As you take inventory, review the rumors. Much of this brokenness that has taken place in America is because of our neglect. Yes, even the neglect of the church. But I want you to notice that Nehemiah was committed to getting something done. And as he took inventory, he prayed. Ladies and gentlemen, this was Nehemiah's Gethsemane. You remember when Jesus was in the garden praying for us? Nehemiah was in a garden of broken down walls praying for his people. He reviewed the ruins patiently. And as he did so, he was led by the Holy Spirit. He reviewed the ruins persistently. He saw things as they really were. And he reviewed these ruins privately. You see, too much of our evaluation is based on the world's standards rather than the standards of God. Let me ask you, how do we face up to the standards of God? <laughs> Wouldn't you think that the creator of this universe would have a high standard? And, and you're asking yourself, how can I measure up to the standards of God? Well, again, you're thinking in human terms. Take a moment to think in spiritual terms, in simple terms. For God so loved who? The world that He gave His one and only that whoever, whoever believes in Him should not what? Perish, but have what? Everlasting life. That's the standard of God, ladies and gentlemen. The standard of God is grace. All you have to do is say, Lord, I believe. I want to receive that grace. And if you will forgive me, Lord, I will go out and I will do better at building up this wall that has been broken down in my life. I will do better at trying to build up the broken down walls around me. People who are hurting. You see, we will never face our spiritual challenges until we first review the spiritual ruin in our own lives. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to do that? And then finally today, if we're to face the challenge of spiritual renewal, we must remove the reproach. We've got to remove the reproach. If you have a garden of weeds that you would like to turn into a garden of sweet corn, that's my favorite vegetable, by the way. If you have a garden of weeds that you would like to turn into a garden of sweet corn, what do you do? Well, the first thing you do is you remove the weeds. Then you prepare the soil to receive the seed. 
Then you plant the seed. Then you cultivate each, each row to keep the weeds from rooting in. You make sure that the garden has ample water. And soon, if you follow this process, you'll have sweet corn. Now, if you're not happy with your spiritual life, if you're not content with your walk with God, you need to make your request known to God. You need to make your concern known to God in prayer. Then you need to review the ruin in your own life. You know, the spiritual weeds that have surfaced in your life somewhere along the way. And then you remove the reproach. You receive new seed from God's Word. You continue to cultivate your life. You continue to remove the spiritual weeds in each row of your mind. You saturate your mind with the living water. And soon you'll have sweet corn. Well, you know what I mean. Soon you'll have good success. A couple of weeks ago I read a statement from A.W. Tozer. And it really spoke to my heart. Listen as I read it to you. Every farmer knows the hunger of the wilderness. The hunger which no modern farm machinery, no improved agricultural methods can quite destroy. What is the hunger of the wilderness? No matter how well you prepare the soil, how well kept the fences, how carefully painted the buildings, let the owner neglect for a while his prized and valued acres, and they will revert again to the wilds and be swallowed up by the jungle or the wasteland. The bias of nature is toward the wilderness, never toward a fruitful field. The bias of this carnal life, the bias of this carnal life left unattended, will go back to carnal living. You see, if we're going to live fruitful lives, that's something we've got to work at. That's something we've got to pay attention to. So, I want you to notice what it says in verse 17 as I read the remainder of the chapter. It says, Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Now, Nehemiah is approaching the uh, townspeople of Jerusalem. You see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come and let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be a disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God upon me, and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. But when Sembalat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and they ridiculed us. What is this you are doing? They asked. Are you rebelling against the king of Persia? I answered them by saying, The God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historical right to it. Now notice that. Verse 17. He says, so let us rebuild so that we won't be a reproach or a disgrace any longer. And then he makes this claim at the end. Our God will give us success. Three simple points I want to close with today. Removing the reproach, notice there, it involves a call. It involves a calling. And you and I, we have this special calling from God. God wants us to change our corner of the world. He wants us to do that. And there are no eithers, ifs, ands, or buts. The hand of God is here. The hand of God is upon us. And we must acknowledge His calling. Now, removing the reproach not only involves a calling, but it involves cooper cooperation together. My cooperation with God, His cooperation with me, 
your cooperation with God, His cooperation with you. Nehemiah said, And I told them how the hand of God was favorable to me. I also told them about the king's words that he had spoken to me. And so the people said, If that's what God has said, and if the king is behind us, they said, Let us arise and build. And verse 18 says they began putting their hand together for a good work. Along the wall, the people would work. There would be no separation. There would be no divisive spirits. There was one vision, one purpose, no church where people who are at odds with one another has ever seen revival. Most churches wrestle on their knees against their real enemy, Satan. And our commission is to win the world for Jesus. But to be able to do that, we need a fresh anointing today. And finally, removing the reproach involves a claim. It involves a claim. Nehemiah said, the God of heaven will give us success. Therefore, we as servants, we're claiming it. We're going to arise and we're going to build. As soon as Nehemiah said, let us arise and build, the enemy said, let us arise and stop him. But you know what? The same is true today. There is no serious opposition to the church until Christians get serious about claiming the promises of God. But that's what we're all about. If we are not claiming the promises of God, the wilderness will take this church over with. And we will just be a spot on the hill. One more farming analogy and then I'll close. You know what happens to a seed that is willing to be abandoned and dropped into the earth? That seed swells and breaks. It breaks open. And once that seed breaks open, something magnificent happens. It loses its identity. Think about it. The roots go down. The shoots go up. It's no longer a seed. It loses its identity. The roots go down. The shoots go up. And do you know what happens to all of the starch that was in that little seed? It turns into sugar. And then that little seed begins producing other seeds like itself. That's what we need today. So let me ask you. Are you a seed that's on exhibit? Or are you a seed that has been planted in the ground, rooted in Jesus Christ? Listen to me today. If you have a need for rededication today, I would encourage you. I would encourage you to choose to make that public today. We have plenty of room. If somebody feels a need to come down into this altar area and pray, I think that we can do that and still provide some measure of social distancing. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I would encourage you to walk up to me personally during our song of invitation. And I would be proud and honored to pray with you for you to trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today. Let's pray together. Father God, as we get ready to move into our time of commitment. Lord, if you are dealing with hearts, dear Father, about renewing themselves to a new calling, claiming your promises, being the church that you would have us to be, dear God, we pray that you would touch our hearts right now. And Father, I also pray that if there is even one person or two people, dear Father, that is not certain about their salvation, but they want to be before this morning ends, dear Father. I pray that you would give them the courage during this last song to just literally walk up to me so that they and I can have prayer together and so that they can receive what you would have them to receive here today. Bless us in this moment, I pray, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, I ask. Amen. If you have a need, won't you come? I'll be standing right here. Let's stand together as we sing.
Uh, Philippians was a really good one, so make sure you pick those up and that you keep up and, and if you want to, review them multiple times. The um, uh, other things that we need to, to make sure that, that we are aware of is the food pantry. If there's anybody that is in need, that uh, refer them to Sarah or actually refer them to, to someone else on the mission council. Well, uh, Sarah's going through her surgery and that. Um, speaking of the mission council, why don't we meet after the service like down here instead of meeting tomorrow night? We've, I've got a couple things we need to, to run over. Um, the, the trustees are, have been doing an awful lot of work or working through a lot of things on the, on the sanctuary and they're inviting everybody after this. If you want to go over and look at it and see what's going on, it looks different. So take the opportunity to, to go over there and kind of look through a little bit. But at the last reminder, of course, is we need to maintain proper social distancing and with wear a face mask and things like that. And uh, as always, if you if you have announcements in that that need to get into Bolton, make sure that you, you um, send a, an email to Sarah to the church email, and we'll make sure we get in there and uh, we can announce that during the service as well. If you would go ahead and stand, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Let's pray. Our dear Father, Lord, we just thank you for this day. Thank you for, for the, the rain you sent last night and, Lord, for the sunshine we have now. Lord, the, the opportunity to come to your house is, is always so sweet. After a time of, of not being able to be together, Lord, every time that we meet now, it, it's a special occasion. Lord, we just thank you for who you are and what you've done for us. And Lord, as, as we examine our lives, help us that we would be where our Bible starts. And Lord, we just ask you to continue to be with many folks on our prayer list, those that are that are hurting and sick, and Lord, and those that are that are affected by the virus in our community. Lord, we just ask that you would help us, that we would be your arms, your hands, your feet, your eyes, and your heart. Lord, help us to always do your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.